Amen. Thank you, Louise. That's just a beautiful way to start a worship service. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you who are here with us this morning, all my mask-wearing friends. And those of you who are not able to wear masks, we're grateful that you're all here with us this morning. And we're also grateful if you're with us online. Um, wherever you're worshiping, the key is to worship. And when I talked to God this morning, I asked that this day be so filled with worship and that you would leave worship wherever you are, feeling that you had been blessed, that God had been glorified, and his name had been lifted up. And that's why we're here. So good morning, and I'm glad you're here. And I do appreciate you taking all the precautions because COVID-19 hasn't gone away. You know that from people in the community who have it and are in the process of recovering. And we have no idea um, when it's going to go away, but we do know that God is in charge. I do have a few announcements this morning. These beautiful flowers on the altar are from Holly McClay, now Paz Derrick's. And Mylan Posderick's wedding, which was yesterday afternoon and evening. And um, we really appreciate that they have beautified our altar with them this morning. Peace meals continue on Wednesdays, curbside pickup only uh, between 5 and 6. And then, of course, Ignite service goes on at 7. That is live. You're welcome to attend it live. It's also live streamed. We still need that part-time secretary that we're looking for. It's a 15 to 20 hour a week job. And the most important thing that you could have would be excellent communication skills and excellent computer skills. So if you are interested in applying for that job, please check for a job description in the office and um, you can contact PPR and um, let them know that you have an application. If you're on SPRC, there is a meeting this Thursday in person with our district superintendent, Reverend Fashbaugh, and that meeting's at 8 o'clock. So please, that's an important meeting, and we look forward to having you here. And I have some really exciting news. We are up to $9,500 or $9,450 so far in our matching campaign. So we really could use a giver or two who would like to finish that $550 for us so that we can use up all of the $10,000 matching fund. We're just that close, and we've done that in two weeks. What a giving church. And finally, please remember your prayer requests and praises. There's a box in the narthex for you to put them in, and we take them seriously and pray over them um, all week long, really. So I'm going to call us to worship this morning by reading Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2 from the New International Version. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Our pastor's wife, Janice Hazley, has requested this first hymn. It is a wonderful expression of our praise to God. And I think many of you will know it, but just in case you need to be refreshed, we're going to sing the chorus here on the platform the first time, and then we'll sing it the second time. And for that second chorus, I will ask the people here in the sanctuary to stand and then join as you're able in singing, I will praise him. And we encourage our people in their homes to join as well. The words will be on display on the screen. Yeah. 
After that song, that is our prayer. We praise you with all of our hearts. We love you with all of our hearts. And we're thankful for the day that's set apart to be able to do that. Lord, we praise you. We praise you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, here is our virtual hug. And everybody demonstrate that because this is a day that we're going to praise him. Good morning, everyone. I'm Calvary Kirshner, the Children's Ministry Director, and I want to let you know what's going on in Kidsmen. Next week, we're going to have a really big week. We are going to start the week with the moving on up. Um, if you are starting kindergarten, we welcome you to join us for small group and junior church in the lab. And if you are entering sixth grade, we officially say goodbye after this week and usher you into youth group. Your Sunday school class is downstairs directly under the welcome area. Don't be scared. You'll be joined with familiar faces down there. And you get to start hanging out here in the sanctuary for the whole service. Also, next week, we will, be ble um, we will have blessing of the backpacks. This is a special time when you as a congregation are invited to come down to the lab and pray over all the kids and anyone who works in the school system right after this service. We ask the kids to bring in their backpacks just as a symbol of school. So whether you are going back to school in the school building full time, doing the online option, or if you are homeschooled, we wanna pray blessings and protection over you this upcoming school year. And this will take place between 10 and 10.15 in the lab. So please join us. We will be doing it as socially distancedly as possible <laughs> with still being able to speak blessings over our kids and the school employees. 
Also next week, we will have acolyte training for all new second graders or anyone who has not had the training. And that will take place directly after the blessing of the backpacks here in the welcome area behind the sanctuary. And also next week, we will be doing second grade Bible Sunday. Our second graders are really becoming good readers, and we think that they should be reading the best book ever written. So they will be receiving their very own Bible. And that will be done during each of the services. So whichever service you attend, you will receive your Bible during that time. And one last thing that will be happening next week is that we will be connecting you, the congregation, with a school-aged child or youth um, for prayer partners this year. So be ready for that. And this week in kids' ministry, we are continuing to talk about how indescribable God is and how he created us to be creative. So kids, please join me in the lab at 10 a.m. for small group hour and for junior church during the 1115 service. The prayer chorus is, He is Lord. Let us prepare our hearts for the pastoral prayer as we sing together, He is Lord. Father, what an interesting and, if we'll approach it correctly, enlightening time we live in. It is a time that has made the portions of the scripture come alive. When in the Old Testament a natural disaster would occur, a drought, a famine, or pestilence, which is an old, old name for pandemic, the Hebrews would, under their strain and anxiety, cry out, How long, O Lord? Those Hebrews, our spiritual ancestors, when revival was the only answer for them, the faithful rem remnant would cry out, How long, O Lord? And the answer God sent was not a secret, and it was invariably the same. Turn to me in repentance. Trust me and walk with me. We cry out to you today as they did then. In the midst of a pandemic, in dire need of revival. And the answer is familiar. Turn to me in repentance and trust. Walk with me and I will bring healing to your land, your community, your church, your family, to you. And so let us, Lord, in trust, cast all our cares upon you, for you care for us, and our anxieties will diminish. We come to you, Lord, in gratitude this morning for the improving health of Bill Elder, of Bill Van Nordstrand, of Rick Scott. We continue to pray for Jackie Strong, Jenny Durbin, and others in our church family and our extended church family. We pray for all these that in their healing, all praise will be yours. Lord, even in worship, no matter how well-intentioned we are, we cannot worship you properly without the enablement of your Holy Spirit. Help us today, Lord. Help us today to bless you and make us 
aware of your love, your patience, and your desire to step in when we humbly call out to you. We do that now, Lord. We do that now in the prayer that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. It's interesting to me how the Holy Spirit um, puts the hearts of the members of this body on my mind throughout the week. And I, I just think about how giving you all are. Um, I just, I'm blown away, and I don't know why I even say that, to be honest with you, but I'm blown away that in two weeks, we came up with $9,450 for matching funds for the sound system in the great room. And that doesn't just happen in any congregation. It happens in a congregation where people want to move the ministry forward where we want to preach the gospel and reach out in the community and we know that that room was built for that purpose and what a blessing it is that you would be that giving. I also think of the fact that I've been up here asking for someone to come and volunteer to teach junior high and to volunteer to help with the youth group when it starts back up in September. I didn't make that announcement this morning because we have those volunteers now. So I thank you. I mean, that's a hallelujah. That is a hallelujah. Every act of giving is an act of worship. And so I just thank you and praise God for every single one of you here and online because I know that you know you can do your tithes and offerings online you can send them in by mail. You can walk them up to this box and place them here or in the narthex. What a giving congregation you are. And we are indeed blessed. So we thank you. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful for every good and perfect gift with which you have bestowed us. We just thank you for giving us stewardship over all you've given us. We know none of it's ours. Not our talent, not our time, not our treasure. It all belongs to you. So this is our opportunity to give back in some way. And we just trust that what we are giving is good and pleasing in your sight and will honor you and glorify your holy name, that name of Jesus, in whom we pray. Amen. Fifty-eight years ago was my first opportunity to be a pastor's wife. My husband had a church 125 miles away from where we lived. And so that Christmas in 1962, I sang my first solo. At that time, I had a very high voice, so a soprano. Today, 58 years later, it's a low voice. But the neat thing was about it is the fact that I never dreamed that I'd ever be a pastor's wife. And now I've been a pastor's wife two times. But in the word it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And to find out how and why you were made for that purpose, 
It was a miracle. It took a miracle for me to sing that song. Father is omnipotent, and that you can deny, a God of might and miracles, is written in the sky. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. The Bible tells us of his power and wisdom always through, and every little bird and flower our testimonies too. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me it took a miracle of love and grace. Though here his glory has been shown, we still can't fully see. The wonders of his might, his throne, twill take eternity. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole. It took a miracle of love and grace. We just sung about the miracle, and one of the miracle stories in the Bible is today's scripture reading. And I'd like to invite you, if you're here in the sanctuary, to stand in respect for the word of God. There had been no rain for three and a half years. And this lesson begins at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41, where we read, The prophet Elijah said to King Ahab, Go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And the servant went and looked toward the Mediterranean. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, 
he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Joy. Gary, thank you. <clears throat> so last week we looked at that great confrontation, which was, in many people's eyes, the highlight of Elijah's life when the prophets of Baal were defeated. And it seems that immediately after that, while everyone is still on top of Mount Carmel, Elijah turns to King Ahab and he says, Go up, eat and drink, for there's the sound of of heavy rain. And when you read that, you get the impression after three and a half years that Elijah actually heard the rain coming. I mean, it, it, it reads, there's the sound of heavy rain. But that's really not what's going on here. See, I love the rain. I love the storms this time of year. Usually you can see, you can hear them coming. The sky gets dark. The winds pick up. You hear distant thunder, perhaps see some lightning. Maybe you can even smell the rain coming. I love the smell of rain in the summer. And so you get the impression that Elijah is experiencing some of these signs of rain. After three and a half years, it's on the way. But that is not what's going on. If you look closely at the scripture... It is clear that there's not a cloud in the sky, there's no thunder or lightning, there's no indication that rain is on the way. Instead, what Elijah heard was the voice of God. He heard the voice of God saying that rain was on the way before there was any sign of it. In fact, the Hebrew word sound here, as in I hear the sound of a heavy rain, is actually translated voice. Now, Elijah was certain that the rain was coming, not because he heard the sound of rain or thunder, but because he listened to God's voice. Now, why would he tell Ahab to go and eat and drink? Because there was a drought and famine, food and water were scarce. It was no small thing to eat or drink. Elijah is actually encouraging Ahab, the wicked king, to eat and drink. He's telling him in so many words, the drought's over. Go, get, go grab something because you're not going to have to worry anymore about where your next meal or your next drink is coming from. And notice after the, Elijah told the king to eat and drink, Ahab went off and did just that. In other words, at that point, Ahab believed Elijah. Initially, three and a half years earlier, when Elijah proclaimed there'd be no rain, Ahab didn't believe him. He just saw him as a troublemaker. But after what he had just seen on Mount Carmel, he was now convinced that the word of Elijah was true and that he was the servant of the true God. God is actually teaching Ahab through Elijah. If Ahab will listen, God will draw Ahab to himself through Elijah. Folks, God gives opportunities for everyone to come to him, no matter how evil they may be. Ahab is actually being instructed by God through these events. I have seen in the events that are going on around us today, I have seen so many people being instructed by God. Oh, they, they might, they might um, call it something else. They might call it being discouraged or being depressed. They might think that uh, there's a lack of hope in their lives. But what they're actually feeling is God drawing them to himself. God is doing a work in the midst of all that's going on. If you know someone who for all intents and purposes seems out of the reach of God, pray that God will send somebody in their life. Pray that God will arrange circumstances to teach them and touch them. And God will. So let's look at how Elijah here prayed. And let's learn from it. The first thing uh, that I, I'd like for you to uh, understand here is that Elijah separated himself. He got apart from the people. 
He went back up on top of Mount Carmel. Do you have a spiritual or do you have a, a special, a special place of prayer? Do you have a place where you go every day, a place that is apart from distractions, a place that is apart from the noise that is around you? You just get away. Now, you might not be able to climb to the top of a mountain, but you do need a place of separation, a place to meet alone with God. Abraham frequently returned to Bethel, the place where he first built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. It was in that familiar, intimate setting that he found refreshing fellowship with the Lord. The place you choose, it can be real simple. Small room in the house, your back porch maybe. But it needs to be somewhere where you won't be disturbed. Just a place to be alone with God. Next thing Elijah did was humble himself. He humbled himself. He crouched down on the ground, the Bible says, put his face between his knees. That is a position of subjection, of humility. Now, in one way, in one way, Elijah's in a very dangerous position because he's just coming off a great victory. It's hard to be humble at times like that. He had just had the greatest thing that had ever happened to him happen to him. He had the most public victory of his life. But he goes right back to where that occurred. But he's not there to crow about it. He's not there to say, look at me, everybody, and what happened through me. No, he goes back to that place, and he bows down in subjection to God. Next, Elijah was specific in prayer. He told his servant to look for one thing, a sign of rain. God had promised rain, and Elijah was confident God would keep that promise. Folks, we need to be specific in our prayers. If you need a job, pray for a job. If you need an engineering job, pray for an engineering job. If you are susceptible to a certain fear, name the fear and ask God for relief. If it's envy, call it by name and ask God for help. Specifically, ask God for what it is you need. Ask him in prayer. If someone would come to you and say, I need help, what would be your first question? Your first question would probably be, what kind of help do you need? What is it that I can do for you? And if they would say in reply, I need help. If they just keep saying, I need help, I need help. Well, we wouldn't be any closer to actually helping them than when we started. We need to know exactly what they need before we can help them. Now, God knows what we need, but he wants us to know what we need. And he wants us to identify it and be specific in prayer. Elijah was persistent in prayer. He told his servant to go back and check seven times. It is difficult when you're under pressure. It is difficult when you're facing a deadline. It is difficult when you've been waiting a long time to wait. That's one of the main tests we face, the main tests of faith, and that's waiting. God wants to build patience and persistence in us. He is blessed when we trust him enough to go back seven times or 17 times. How many of you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands, and don't worry, you're you're all behind the camera, so you don't have to worry about this. How many of you have a prayer matter you've been praying about for years? Practically everyone here. God is blessed by your faithful persistence. Like the widow that kept after the judge, God values your persistence. Remember that God always, God always keeps his promises. Because Elijah knew that, and because Elijah believed that, he would wait. And so he persisted in prayer, and he humbled himself before God. Fervency and faith go hand in hand. Next, Elijah was expectant. It was not until the seventh time that the servant checked that a very small cloud, like a man's hand, appeared in the middle of the sea. But that was enough for Elijah and the action, and he acted upon what he expected to happen. Folks, faith sees the small sign. 
Faith sees the small sign and it takes those small signs as an encouragement to be persistent in prayer. If we are not walking closely with the Lord, we might miss the small signs and thus fail to be encouraged. Can you see, those of you that raised your hands, I want to ask you, can you see a cloud rising? It might just be the small sign, but can you see a cloud rising? I've had folks come to me here just in the last couple of weeks, and they say about what they're going through. They they name things that they're going through, and they're caught up in what they're going through. And, And I see, I think, God has given me insight, I see in the very difficult thing that they name, a cloud rising. A cloud rising. God starting to move. Can you see that, folks? Can you see that? Can you see that cloud rising? Have you been without a job for months? Can you see that cloud rising? Have you been praying for that spouse or child for a long, long time? Can you see that cloud rising? See the signs. See the signs. And I would encourage you, praise the Lord now. Before the rain hits. Before the storm comes. Praise Him now. Because you know it's coming. You've seen the cloud. And you know it's coming. Elijah was so sure about what was to happen that he told the servant to tell Ahab to get his chariot going or else he's going to get stuck on the mountain. I've told you before, uh, Mount Carmel, it's kind of a a difficult place to get to. Uh, And if it is now, it certainly was then. And what Elijah is telling Ahab is, you better get going. It's going to start raining. And you're going to get caught in the mud here on the mountain unless you get down quickly. And so um, that's what Ahab did. He took off. I remember being on top of that mountain. And looking west toward the Mediterranean. And because of the conditions that day, you could not quite see the Mediterranean. But I could visualize the scene. And I stood there and I imagined that small cloud rising from the sea. Growing and heading, heading our way. And you knew, Elijah knew when he saw that, that God had answered his prayer. He knew when he saw that, not that he had doubted, but he knew at that point that God had kept his promise. He knew that rain was on the, on the way. The human eye could only see a little cloud, but the eye of faith saw the promise of God. Ahab wouldn't have even noticed the small cloud, but to Elijah, God's promise was a done deal before it ever happened. Do you live, folks, expectantly? Do the little things excite you? Life is full of opportunities to see God's hand in the little things, but only those in tune with Him, abiding in Him, see those small things and smile and live on tiptoes in expectation. Children can be good teachers when it comes to living in expectation and expectation in prayer. If you tell a child you'll do something, that child will remember that And that child will bring it up to you time and time again. Now, let's be truthful. How often often have we told a child, yeah, we'll do that later. We'll do that later. And your thought is, when you say that is, the little squirt's going to forget it by the time later rolls around. Well, the little squirt never does forget it. And later rolls around, and that child will say, come on, you promised. You promised. Children are not surprised when the answer comes. Children are not surprised. When they pray, they expect an answer. That's how we should be. But we get older. We get older and we kind of grow too sophisticated for things like that. We say things like, well, let's be realistic about that. We lose expectancy. We lose hope. We lose the urgency of hope. The joy of faith that keeps us excited and persistent. Elijah's God was the God who kept his promises. Elijah's God and our God, it's the exact same God, was the God of the impossible. And as the rain fell, 
the power of the Lord came on Elijah. And he hitched up his pants and he ran all the way to Jezreel, about 13 miles away. Now picture Ahab in his chariot, pulled by at least one or two horses. He's probably off the mountain by now, but he's having a tough go of it in the mud. He's trying to get in out of the weather. And as he's there trying to, trying to prompt his horses through the mud, <laughs> Elijah goes sprinting by him. Now, I, I said he believed Elijah and his word, and, and, and he does, but that doesn't mean he likes Elijah. And I'm sure as Elijah went running past Ahab, oh, I'm sure that just made Ahab's blood boil. But yet he, he passed him by in the strength of the Lord. I've told you this story before, but years ago, I, when I went to annual conference, it's been over, eh, maybe over 20 years now. Um, uh, when I went there, my transmission in my vehicle went out on the way. And so I got up there, went to annual conference, and then I was on my way home. And the, the transmission, whenever I would get out of first gear, it would cause the car to quit. It just caused the car to stop. And so I would, I, I drove from, I drove from Lakeside to East Liverpool, Ohio, which I think is about over 190 miles. And all the way I drove, I couldn't go over 18 miles an hour. And when I got, when I got up to 18 miles an hour, the car would quit. And I had to roll off the side and start it up again. Now, I cannot tell you I still remember this to this day. You know, you go, I kind of went through back roads down 250 that way to, to get back through Amish country. On my way, all on my way back, I was being passed by Amish people in horses and buggies. I can't tell you. You would not have wanted to be around me by the time I got home. About six hours. It was about a six-hour trip, I think. And I had been passed by horses all the way. I can just imagine how Ahab felt. It was important that Elijah get off that mountain. Because as we're going to see next week, Ahab's going to run to his wife, going to run to his wife Jezebel, and he's going to say, oh, honey, honey, look at, you just never, you just never guess what Elijah did. And he's going to tell her the whole story. And quite frankly, I think she was more evil than he was. And so she said, okay, I'm going to kill him. By this time tomorrow, he's a dead man. Now, if he was still on Mount Carmel, he would be easy to find. But he just passed Ahab in Ahab's chariot, and they don't know where he's at now. So he's out of the clutches of the evil king and queen. That's why the Holy Spirit gave him the power to sprint all the way to the town of Jezreel, 13 miles away. God is protecting him. James 5, 17, 18 says this, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it didn't rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Notice what James in the New Testament does not say. He does not make reference to the fact that Elijah was a mighty prophet. Doesn't call him that. Does not make reference to the fact that Elijah was a mighty miracle worker. Doesn't call him that. He doesn't say that Elijah was an example that nobody can match. Doesn't call him that. He says Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. We're so mindful of our weak and sinful nature sometimes, let me tell you something, Elijah was exactly like us. He had a nature like ours. He had his doubts and his fears. He was a man just as we are. He, but here's the key. He served the same God we serve. The God who keeps his promises. Now I want to ask you today, what has God promised that you're still waiting on? Is it the salvation of a family member? Is it a new job? Is it a health condition? 
in the closeness of your walk with the Lord right now, are you capable of seeing the small signs like a tiny cloud rising over the Mediterranean that the fulfillment of God's promise to you is on its way? Elijah was able to see and declare by faith a man just like us that after three and a half years, rain was on the way. The fulfillment of God's promises to you. I say to you from the pulpit here on the authority of the word of God. The fulfillment of God's promises to you are on the way. They're on the way. By faith, folks, see the signs. By faith, declare the faithfulness of God before the answer has even arrived. Or at least the answer that we can see has arrived. And so today the altar is open and the invitation is given to declare your trust in God's faithfulness. To say to God, I trust you. I trust you that my spouse is going to come to know Christ as their Savior. I trust you that my wayward child is going to, is going to come to know Christ as their Savior. I'm seeing the signs Maybe nobody else can see them, but I, see, I saw a little sign that their heart's starting to warm a little bit, that their heart's starting to melt a little bit. I'm seeing the signs. Lord, I feel that inner peace. You are going to give me that job that I so desperately need. Lord, I am trusting you that I'm going to hear back from the doctor in the coming week, and it's going to be a good report. I am trusting you, Lord. I see the signs, I perceive the signs that the promise is on its way. And so again today, the altar is open and the invitation given to declare your trust in God's faithfulness here in the sanctuary. If you're at home and you're watching online, bow right where you're at. Take a moment and bow right where you're at about that matter that you're still waiting on and say, God, I trust you. You may have to keep going back, you may have to go back time and time and time again as Elijah had to send his servant. But I'm telling you, the answer is on its way because God keeps his promises. And so today, just bow there where you're at and say, God, I trust you. I thank you in advance, and I'm going to declare the victory right now. Not because anything in myself, but because I trust you. And you are a promise-keeping God, and you're going to keep your promise to me as found in your word. It might just be a small cloud, like a man's hand rising from the Mediterranean, but just that smallest sign, let that be an encouragement to you to know that God, that God is sending the answer to your prayer. The altar is open, the invitation given as our worship team leads us in our closing hymn. This hymn of invitation and commitment is only trust Him. Here in the sanctuary, if you will join us Please stand as we sing.
was a line in uh, one of the verses of that song that really just jumped out at me. It said, believe in him without delay. That may be what's going on in many of our lives. We say, God, in the delay, in the delay, and then I'll believe in you. And perhaps God is saying, believe in me right now without delay, and then I'll send the answer. So before you see the answer, but you can see that small cloud rising from the Mediterranean, believe in God, believe in him without delay, declare your trust in him, and I promise you, God will answer your prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are a promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God. You have never made a promise that you did not keep. And so, Lord, when you, when you cause your word to leap out at us off the pages of the Bible and that word becomes ours and we claim that as a promise from you, we can rest assured that you will answer that prayer. And so, Lord, today, for those things that have been burdening our hearts for a long time, Lord, we say, I can see that small cloud rising. I can see that the answer is on its way. And I will trust you before there's ever a drop of rain. I will trust you that it's coming. And may you be glorified in the wait until the realization of the promise hits. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>